Our passage this morning is going to be Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. Mark 3, 13 through 19. So if you would turn there with me, uh, we'll go ahead and read that passage today. Here's what Mark writes. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonadrus, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time this morning where we can gather together uh, and study your word. Uh, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would uh, convict us this morning and that your word would speak to us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How many of you have ever heard of the film Seven Samurai? Anybody heard of that one? Seven Samurai, by a Japanese director named Akira Kurosawa. I'm going to go, I, I, I like film, I like classic films. This is one of those ones that is a, a classic. And the way that the, the film is structured is you have this group of unlikely heroes who come together, the Seven Samurai. They come from, they have these different personalities and they're clashing and they're button heads all the time. But in the end, they end up coming together, uh, united around a common cause, and many of them end up sacrificing themselves. Now, maybe you've heard of the remake of that film, The Magnificent Seven. Uh, heard of that one? Okay, I, I see some more people have seen that one or heard that one with Steve McQueen, Yul Brenner. Uh, that, that was a remake of The Seven Samurai, and it's the same type of idea. These seven cowboys who are really good at what they do, they're gunfighters or whatever, and they've got these personalities, and they clash, but they all come together around this common cause and work for the greater good. Another one came out here recently, just this year, really big movie. The Avengers. Did anybody see The Avengers? Yeah, I saw The Avengers. That was a good movie. I liked that one. Um, but same type of idea. You have this kind of odd cast of characters, superheroes in this case, but they've got these completely different personalities, and you put them together, and a good portion of the film is these guys just going at it. They don't get it. They're not understanding. They're not united around any type of common cause. You've got Captain America and Iron Man. Iron Man's kind of this arrogant type of personality. Captain America's selfless, and they're going at it, button heads. But in the end, they all unite around a common cause. So what do all these, have in, all these different films have in common, all these different characters? It's not a group of people who you would expect to come together and be used for something great. In each case, it's a, a motley crew of people, different personalities, different backgrounds. And when they get together, initially, things don't go, go so well. But in the end, they are doing great things. And today, we see in this passage the assembly of what's pretty much a motley crew of disciples. And we'll get into kind of looking at these men and why it was that they were so odd that they would be put together. But first, let's get back into verse 13 here. It says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. So the first thing that we see here is that Jesus has gone up onto the mountain. Do you remember where he was last week? He was down by the sea. He was doing ministry by the sea. The crowds were coming in, pushing in around him, and he was going around and healing them. And he had, made a, had a boat ready just in case he needed to make a getaway, in case the crowds were uh, pushing in too hard. But now Mark transitions us to a mountaintop scene. Have you seen 
mountaintops anywhere else in Scripture? Think back to the Old Testament, back to the book of Exodus. You recall a mountaintop in Exodus? Moses, this uh, child who had been raised as an Egyptian and ends up being exiled, sent out into the wilderness, basically rescued and adopted by uh, some, some sheep herders out there. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like Moses is going to spend the rest of his life herding sheep or goats or whatever out here in the wilderness. But what happens? He goes up onto the mountain and he has an incredible encounter with God at the burning bush. And it completely changes the course of, the, of his life. This man who was going to be just herding sheep for the rest of his life ends up going back to the very place where he had been exiled, standing before Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the ruler of the most powerful nation in the world. This would be like, uh, you know, somebody coming off the street corner, walking into the White House and talking to the president. That's this, what this would be like. Moses comes in and talks to Pharaoh, says, let my people go. His life was dramatically changed by an encounter with the living God on a mountaintop. Now, we see a mountaintop again in Exodus, don't we? The people of Israel, they come out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They come to the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses, once again, goes up onto the mountain, and God's law is given on the mountaintop. And so through Scripture, we see that's one of the most common ones. But we see this theme of people going on to the mountain and God being there and it being just an incredible uh, encounter that changes lives, changes the course of history. Moses being up on the mountain and getting the Ten Commandments, this essentially establishes the nation of Israel proper. They get what are their legal documents. It's like the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence are given to the people of Israel there, and they are established as a nation, this nation that God is going to ultimately use to bless the world through Jesus Christ. It happened. It started there on that mountaintop. And so once again, we see a mountaintop. Jesus going up on the mountain, and it says he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Now this is an interesting choice of language here. He called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Remember what we were talking about just last week. Verse 7 of chapter 3. Look back there with me. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee, Judea, etc., the surrounding regions. So Jesus had a great crowd of people who had been following him, who had shown up, who had wanted to see a miracle or, or to have a, a friend or a family member healed. But then Mark pulls us down into a much narrower view, and he says that out of all of these crowds of people, Jesus chooses a small handful to go up on the mountaintop with him. So what can we learn from this? Well, not everyone who is in close proximity to Jesus, not everyone who is in close proximity to the church is going to be chosen by Jesus. Now, let's unpack that a little bit. We've talked a little bit about the crowds in Mark. So far in Mark, the way he has presented the crowds to us is that they don't really get Jesus. They're there for their own personal motivations. They're not there to glorify Jesus to, uh, out of a desire to become a disciple of his, to follow him. They are there for their own motivations. They don't really care about the bigger picture. They don't really care about repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand, which was the message Jesus was proclaiming. So they are missing the big picture of who Jesus is. Does that not happen sometimes in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own churches, where you have people who grow up 
in proximity to the church in some way. And that can look differently. Maybe they grow up in the church. Maybe they have a family that uh, has been around the church their entire lives. But they are in close proximity to the church all their life. And they know all the right answers. They know, uh, the, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know. They know, uh, they can tell you some Bible trivia even. But does that close proximity to the church, does knowing the right answers, does church attendance or whatever it is, does that necessarily mean that that person is a child of God? It doesn't. It doesn't. And these crowds were all around Jesus. I mean, think about that for a minute. They were all around the Savior of the universe, God Himself, just close enough to touch Him in some cases. And even then, the people missed it. And so just being around Scripture, being around the church, being around uh, Christian people does not guarantee in any way one's salvation. It says... He called to him those whom he desired. That's kind of a tough passage, isn't it? Because not everybody in this circumstance was chosen by Jesus to be one of his disciples. Now, I'm sure there were some really uh, standout folks in that crowd, but Jesus didn't call all of them. He only called a few. He only chose a few. And that might come off as a little harsh in some cases. Uh, Sometimes we look at passages like this where we very clearly see God's sovereignty at play, and that's what this is. This is God's sovereignty. He is choosing for himself the people who he is going to use. And we go, ah, well, why couldn't he just, you know, bring the whole crowd up on the mountaintop with him? Why didn't he just make them all his disciples? Why don't we have the, the thousand instead of the twelve? And church, we have to be really careful when we do that because we start looking at things from the wrong perspective. When we look at things from that perspective, we have an attitude that any of us deserves salvation, that any of us deserves to have been chosen by God. Now look at it from the other perspective, that all of us are sinners. All of us deserved condemnation. None of us deserved to be chosen by God. It is by God's grace and His mercy that He saves any of us, because none of us deserved that. And so when we look at God's sovereignty and we look at God's choosing, sometimes it's, it's, it's really easy to just kind of, ah, oh, I, I don't like that. I, I don't like that idea that, that God chooses people, that it, it just doesn't make sense with a loving and merciful God. But when you look at it from the perspective that not a single person deserved that, that all of us deserved the condemnation, we begin to see God's grace and God's mercy on display. And so it says that Jesus called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Now, notice that it was not the twelve who chose Jesus. It was Jesus who chose them. In the first century, this was kind of an oddity because when it came to rabbis, and that's who Jesus was looked at. He was looked at as a rabbi, as a, a, a teacher, And when it came to rabbis, what would happen is that Jewish men, as they were growing up, what they would do is they would choose the rabbi who they were going to follow. There would be different teachers, and they would have varying degrees of reputation or fame. Uh, One teacher might be known for uh, a particular type of teaching, another one for another, and they would choose one of those rabbis that they wanted to follow. That was the common practice. Uh, it was very, very uncommon for the rabbi to go out and choose his disciples. Think about it like this. Um, Sometimes when you are considering a school to attend, a university, 
It is not unheard of. In fact, it is pretty common to have people who are considering a university based on a particular professor. You know, if you have a professor there who is, uh, we'll pick a field, psychology or something, has specialized in a certain uh, aspect of psychology, and you say, okay, I want to study under that professor, so you choose that university to study under that professor. You don't often hear about it going the other way, do you? Where the professor goes out and he goes to the high school classrooms and he says, you know, that, that student has, has real talent. I'm going to bring him in and I want him to study under me. More often than not, it's the student choosing the professor. Well, Jesus turns that on its head and he goes out and he picks the 12 men who will follow him. And so it was not the disciples who first chose Jesus. Think back to the earlier chapters of Mark where you have Jesus calling the disciples from, you know, they're sitting there on the edge of the sea, engaged in their job, that thing that uh, brings them security, that uh, feeds their family. And do the disciples just pick up and go, hey, there's Jesus. He looks like a promising character. I'm going to follow him. Jesus comes to them and he says, you, follow me. That's the way that it worked. Jesus chose his disciples, chose those whom he wanted to use to follow after him. And that's really an illustration of the way that it works in our own lives too, is it not? Because as sinners, before we knew Jesus, we didn't want anything to do with him. We didn't want anything to do with God, with Scripture, with the standards uh, that are put forth in Scripture. But what happens? The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, draws us to Himself, reveals to us the truth of God's Word. So do you see how that parallels? That it is the Holy Spirit, that it is God who chooses us first, who draws us to Himself, who reveals the truth of Scripture, convicts us of our sin, and then we repent and believe. So it's not us who take that first step. It's God who takes the first step. Just like Jesus calling the disciples. It wasn't the disciples sitting there mending their nets and then deciding, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm going to follow Jesus. It was Jesus coming to the disciples and saying, follow me. Follow me. Now, in verses 14 and 15, we see that Jesus does not just call the disciples and then leave them hanging. He doesn't just call them and say, hey, you guys come follow me, you 12. Uh, I want you to go change the world, uh, but figure it out on your own. He equips them for their calling. He makes it very specific what they're supposed to do. You know, it's not like if you go over and you visit a friend and you're out of town and your friend says, okay, uh, I'll let you drive my car all over town so you can go see the sights or whatever. And you get out to the car and you turn the key and nothing happens. No clicking, no nothing, it's just dead. So you pull and you open up the hood and you notice that there is not even an engine in the car. So your friend has set you up for failure there. They've given you, he's given you a car with no engine. Well, Jesus does not do that here. He does not give the disciples a car with no engine. He makes very clear what they are supposed to do, and he equips them for it. It says in verse 14, And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So two things we see here that the apostles are called and equipped to do. The first one is proclamation. It says, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach, to preach. So their first mission, the first uh, active part of their calling and equipping is to preach the gospel, to preach the good news. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, Sometimes we, like, we look at stuff like that and we see the proclamation part and that kind of makes us cringe a little bit, doesn't it? Just be honest, because in most cases, it's pretty tough to go out there 
and verbally talk about your faith. If you're talking to a non-Christian, maybe someone who you didn't know real well, and to them begin talking to them about the things of God and about Scripture, that's a tough challenge, isn't it? And I think sometimes because it is so tough, we just kind of, we, we want to sweep that one under the rug a little bit, the, the proclamation part, the preaching part. And we say, well, you know, I'm not real good at that preaching, that talking thing anyway. Um, we'll leave it to the professionals. We'll leave it to, to the pastor or maybe, maybe to one of the deacons. We'll let the pastor or the deacons do the preaching or the, the proclamation part. Church, we can't do that. We can't do that. The mission is way, way too big to think that relying on the pastor is going to cut it. Remember last week when we talked about the unreached people groups? The literally billions who don't know Jesus, who have never even been exposed to Jesus? And if the attitude of the church is, is that, well, that, that proclamation thing, that, that's really just for the professional. That's not true. As Christians, we are all called to proclaim the gospel in the mission field where God has planted us. Each one of you has been planted somewhere. And it's going to change throughout your life. If you're younger, I mean, you're going to transition to different things, maybe even different careers. But you are called to proclaim the gospel wherever God has planted you. Whether you're a student, whether you are a teacher, a small business owner, whatever it is, that is your mission field where you are called to proclaim God's word. It's not just for the quote-unquote professionals. I think most pastors would probably tell you that looking at us as professionals is the wrong idea. I'm just a, just a man who God called to do this job. Just like God has called and equipped you to be wherever you are at today. And so you have a unique set of tools. You have unique relationships with people. Some people who you have known for decades. For decades. And to think that some pastor who's been here for 11 months is going to be able to come in and have the same rapport with those folks that you do. That's just false. Church, the mission is too big for all of us not to be proclaiming and preaching. Turn back just a few pages in your Bible with me, would you? Back to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse 18. You all know this passage. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now I know we've got some teachers in this room, some retired teachers. I don't think you can teach real well if you just walked into the front of the classroom and just stood there. I mean, even if you got there and you drew on the, you know, you, you wrote everything out on the chalkboard, maybe if you're a math teacher, you write out all the equations on the chalkboard and then you just stand there. Don't say anything. You've got to use your words. You've got to proclaim. You've got to have words and deeds. And that's why in the New Testament we see that it's not just about going out there and living a good and holy life. That's a big part of it. But you've got to proclaim it as well. And that's why when Jesus calls the apostles, he doesn't just tell them, hey, you know what? You guys just go out there, go back to your fishing, just live a good life in accordance with the scriptures. You don't even have to say a word. And people are just going to see your life and how different you are. You don't ever have to talk to them. And they're just going to go, you know what? I need Jesus. Folks, you've got to tell them. Sure, they might see there's something different about you. But if you don't talk to them, 
if you don't tell them what the Bible says, because this is where it shows you what you have to do to be saved. And if you never open God's word with them, proclaim God's word to them, then just the lifestyle is not enough. There's a quote that is often uh, tied to a church father. It's false. This, is, this church father never said. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been a CC. Um, Lara might know. Preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Somebody made that up at some point and said that some ancient church father said that. He never said that. You preach the gospel with your life and with your words. You've got to have them both. Now look at what else Jesus says here. He doesn't just tell them to preach, but what else does he tell them to do? He's going to call them, he's going to equip them, and they're going to go out and they're going to be equipped to cast out demons. So there you see the two-fold part of the equation. You've got to proclaim the gospel, you've got to preach the gospel, and you've got to have action. You've got to live it out. There is power in God's Word. And so he tells the disciples that they're going to go preach, and they're going to take action. They're going to cast out demons. And so we've got to have them both. We've got to have the balance, proclaiming God's Word and taking action on it. And there's some really concrete ways that you can do that. That's one of the the joys of being involved in a local church is because there are opportunities that come about because of this fellowship for ministry. We talked about some of them today. Trunk or treat, you know? We're going to have kids from all over the community, maybe some parents who are going to come right out here, right, right in front of our church. I mean, what a great opportunity to take action on our faith and have some opportunity maybe even to preach and proclaim. So it's so important that we have both of these. You can't just have the words and then go out and live like a heathen because people are going to look at you and go, eh, no, I don't want what he's selling. You've got to have both the words and the deeds. And truthfully, we tend to err on the side of, well, my actions are just, that they're enough. I don't need to talk to people. They'll look at my life. They'll, they'll see that I go to church. They'll see that I read the Bible. They'll know that that's a priority for me. And that will be enough to get them in the door of the church or to draw them Uh, to the questions that they need to ask about Jesus. Church, we got to talk to them. We have to open God's word with them. And then the two things come together, the words and the deeds. Because they see your life. They see how you raise your family, how you treat your spouse. And then when you come to them, with God's word, and you open it for them. You read them, John 3, 16. You walk down the Romans road with them, and they say, you know what? I can tell that this is real for you, that it's made a difference for you by the way that you live your life. But you've got to have both, the words and the deeds. In the final few verses here, we're introduced to the 12, the whole group. We've seen a few of them already, but we're introduced to the entire group here. And I, I know I sometimes struggle with this, that when I read about the disciples, I tend to kind of see them as they ended up. You know, you read Acts, and you see Peter at Pentecost preaching this powerful sermon, and thousands being saved on that day. That kind of tends to be my picture of Peter. But we're going to discover as we work through Mark that that was not always the way Peter was. And the same with some of these other guys as well. And let's just talk about a few of these here. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. This is one of the guys that we all know. He's, he wrote a few books of the Bible. Uh, he's Uh, one of Jesus' inner circle of disciples, and he calls him Peter. 
Now, you all know what that means, right? Peter comes from the, the Greek word petros, rock, rock. He calls Peter a rock. Now, think about that for a minute. What do you know about Peter? He's kind of a hard-headed guy. He misses it quite often. In fact, he ends up denying Jesus, and he calls Peter Petra, or calls Simon Petros, calls him a rock. That's pretty amazing. I think Jesus definitely knew something about Peter that Peter didn't even know about himself at that time. Calling this fisherman, knowing that later on down the road, after walking with Jesus, after enduring a great hardship, that ultimately he would be willing to die for his faith. Simon called Peter. Now, I love this. You've got these brothers here, James, the son of Je Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. And he calls them the sons of thunder. Now, what in the world does that mean? Sons of thunder? I, when I, I'll be honest. I looked at that and I thought, this probably means that they are just, they, they were powerful men. They were, you know, they, they had deep voices. They were probably energetic preachers and speakers, the sons of thunder. What it really meant is that these guys were hotheads. They had bad tempers. That's why they were called the sons of thunder. And, and you can imagine that. I mean, doesn't that not make you laugh a little bit? I bet that made the other disciples laugh too, you know? These guys are the sons of thunder because, man, they are hotheads. They lose their temper quick and easy. And yet, here are these two hot-headed guys that Jesus calls to be among his disciples. These, were, uh, these were guys were probably really zealous for, uh, the, for Jewish tradition and history. And so it, it probably burned them up pretty good that Jesus would call a tax collector. You see how this is a, a motley crew, an unexpected group of people who you would not think would come together? So you've got the Sons of Thunder, these hot-headed, uh, essentially uber-patriotic for the nation of Israel, with this tax collector who was a traitor who the Jews would want nothing to do with if they were good, self-respecting Jews. And you throw them all together. My goodness. That is not a group of men who you would expect great things from. You notice something else about him, too? Did Jesus go to the elite of his day when he called the disciples? Did he go to the scribes and the Pharisees, the, the ones who had all the theological knowledge, all the book learning, probably the ones who you would expect him to go to? He went to the everyday folks, fishermen, I mean, that's about as common as you could get in that day. A tax collector. Now, it's granted, not a very well-respected job, but a pretty common job. He didn't go to the scribes and the Pharisees, the intelligentsia. He went to the everyday folks. So church, don't ever fall for the lie that Jesus doesn't use people just like you to accomplish incredible things. Because these were men just like any of us. Had regular jobs, but Jesus took them, called them, equipped them, discipled them, prepared them, and then look what he did through them. Regular folks. And if you think that just because you're a normal, average, middle class, whatever, that that somehow means that God is not going to use you or does not use people like you, that is a lie. Because church, it is people exactly like you and exactly like me who God chooses to use over and over and over again. Yeah, he uses the the super smart people too. He uses the, 
the ones who've got all the resources. But more often than not, people just like you and me. So remember that, church. As opportunities come up to serve, as opportunities come up to evangelize, as opportunities come up to go on mission, that that's not just the job for some elite group of people. It's the job for every single one of us. Is that not an amazing thing? I mean, this is one of the things, church, that makes Christianity so countercultural. Because God doesn't use who you would expect. The nation of Israel, why would he use the nation of Israel? They're this little nation of people. Why didn't he use the Egyptians, a powerful nation? No, instead he chooses this little nation of people from which to bless the entire world. Why didn't he go to the scribes and the Pharisees? Choosing these.